there are two times in the gospel stories where it says Jesus marveled. The first was when he went to his hometown of Nazareth and he was rejected by them. They, uh, they just didn't believe that he's the Messiah. They said, is this not Joseph's, uh, the carpenter's son? We know him. We know where he came from. Aren't, aren't his brothers and sisters here? And Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. But the other occasion, which both Matthew and Luke record, was when Jesus healed a centurion's servant. And let me just read this, because this is fascinating to me. Jesus listened to somebody who was from a different situation than him, grew up in a different kind of culture or different subculture, and he listened. The, this other time, the time when Jesus marveled, was when he listened. And that's what I want to emphasize here. In Matthew 8, verse 5, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I tomb a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. When Jesus heard this, it says that he marveled at it. Now this centurion was the definition of other. He's the definition of different. And every reader knew this. Matthew apparently wrote to a Jewish audience. That's kind of the consensus view. Uh, he's uh, directed at those from a Jewish mindset. And for them, a Roman centurion is just other. First of all, he's Roman, so he's not a, he's not a Jew. Secondly, he's a centurion, so he has power. He's in a position of authority, which most of the Jews were not. But he's also the same. This man had the same struggles everybody else had, for the most part. I mean, after he had a servant who was paralyzed and suffering greatly. So he knew tragedy. This man knew pain. He knew human suffering. He had needs like anybody else. Now, the reason I bring this up, sometimes we have the idea that, well, God knows everything. God understands everything. And he does. I mean, God knows everything. But in another sense, God didn't know everything until Jesus came down into our flesh and he lived in our flesh. After Jesus came to live in our flesh, he understood what it's like to be humans. I mean, you, you could say God knew. He knew our existence. He knew what he told us. He knew what we're thinking. He knew all the possibilities of what we'd ever do. Every possibility of what we'd ever do. He knows it. But he didn't know it experientially until he experienced it. Until Jesus took on our flesh in the incarnation did he know it. And even still then, when he's talking to this centurion, he still listens. He still wants to know because in this situation, Jesus grew up in a Jewish culture. I mean, he, he was familiar, of course. Uh, it's funny because he grew up in Nazareth. The nearest city, I believe, was called Sepphoris. And it was a, it was a, big, a big Roman city, a big a, you know, Hellenistic city, uh, very influential. And the New Testament never mentions it. But he was very familiar with this. But still, this was he was on this side. They were on that side. If you understand different sides of the tracks and this guy from the other side of the tracks, basically this centurion comes from the other side of town, asking for something, talks to him and Jesus listens to him. That just really blows me away. What Jesus did to this Gentile is what he did for all of us. I'm talking about the incarnation and I, the, the passage I came to the, the passage I thought of first for this is Philippians chapter two, of course. Um, in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, that word incarnation, um, incarnation is from a Latin phrase, a Latin, well, Latin word that means in fleshing. You know, carne is flesh. 
I know that because I like tacos de carne asada. Uh, meat tacos. Incarnate means he's in our flesh. So Jesus got inside our skin. And I say this because we need to have incarnational listening. We need to be, in a way, incarnate with, with other people. We're, we are in our own skin. In a sense, we are in our own place. And in our relationships with each other, we need to try to get inside each other's skin. Now, there's a situation here in Philippi where uh, there were two women who were in a dispute. Two influential women influential women in this church, Euodia and Syntyche, he mentions in chapter 4. He doesn't say what the issue was, and it doesn't really matter what the issue was. But they were, uh, their dispute was causing problems. They, they couldn't reconcile it for some reason. And it's causing, it, the, the, the tremors went out to the whole church. It was causing a lot of problems. And Paul tells them to... Uh, that's when he tells them, rejoice in the Lord and all these wonderful things he says in chapter four. But as I think about this, you know, why, why am I talking about incarnational listening? Well, it may be obvious. I mean, like that little church was being torn apart by two differing perspectives. I think all of our churches in the nation are potentially being torn apart today. And they're reflecting how differing perspectives in our nation are tearing us apart. And they're trying to divide us. But we, what we need to do to fight that division is to try to get inside each other's skin. Try to understand each other. And that involves primarily listening to each other. Even if we have different skin color, we can still get inside each other's skin the best we can by listening. And I think that's the first and maybe that's the only way that we're going to understand each other. By listening to each other. And we need some of this kind of incarnational listening. We shouldn't stand outside of someone and speak into their lives before we listen from their lives. We may think, and the, the, the problem is we, we, we just exist. I exist in this body. This is my existence. Uh, my, my head here, as you can see, has two eyes, two ears, and all my senses come from the outside. I mean, my sen the sensory devices God gave me, I'm taking in information. But all, I, I just see out here. I, I don't see myself. I, I see out here. I, I exist in this body. But by using those sensory devices, using primarily my ears and my eyes too, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but by using this, I can get inside someone else's existence. This is how God made us. When we talk about this uh, incarnational listening, I'm talking about listening that's open, listening that's not defensive, but be open to hear each other's perspective. It doesn't mean, in whatever the situation is, I'm, I'm thinking primarily in terms of racial tension, but whatever the situation is, <clears throat> we don't have to necessarily agree with each other, but we have to understand each other. Because if we, di if we, disag if we disagree with somebody and you don't understand each other, then you're, you're disagreement isn't founded on anything it's it's probably wrong because it's based on wrong information so what i want to do um based on those biblical principles there based on the fact that jesus came into our flesh to live in our flesh and thus understand us and make a sacrifice for us i want to suggest to you that we need to try to get inside each other's flesh and, and i know that's a weird term it's Kind of gross if you follow that metaphor out, but what I just mean is try to exist inside someone else's perspective. You don't know what it's like to be anybody else. I don't know what it's like to be. Any, you don't know what it's like to be me. And that that divide goes even farther. If if you're a white male, you have an idea of what it's like to be me, but if you're a white female, you don't. I mean, even other uh, white males have an idea of what it's like, but they still don't know my existence. They don't know my parents. They don't know how I how I was brought up or anything like that until they until they listen and learn. And that division goes out for gender and race. Is the far the more differences, the harder it is to understand. So I just want to offer a few suggestions. I got four things I want to tell you briefly um, uh, this evening. First of all, when it comes to incarnational listening, don't make assumptions about people. We should make. We have a, t a tendency to make assumptions about everything. 
And the problem is that we often believe those assumptions are real because we feel it just feels so real to us. It's what our, what our minds are telling us. It's not what our senses are telling us. It's what our brain, it's the way our brain processes the information we take in. That's where we get assumptions. Let me give a few examples. Let's say you're, um, you're walking in a store and you see someone you like. Um, he or she turns to you and smiles and then walks away immediately you're making assumptions you're already you're you're in this place oh they, they they're into me they like me and you're in this place you're in automatically you're thinking forward and what's going to happen and before long you can live in a whole fantasy world just based on someone turning their head and smiling at you i mean that's a huge assumption maybe you uh not that person maybe you get married maybe you marry that person i don't know but you get married and you enter the marriage based on the assumption that your partner sees marriage the same way. And so when you get married, you inevitably disagree on something. And that frustrates you because you made this, you had this assumption that you're going to see it the right, the same way. And then how many times have you said this? And how many times have you heard this? Well, you should have known. Well, we say that because we make assumptions, because we didn't ask questions, because we didn't speak what we thought. Maybe you see somebody in a parking lot. Uh, you're out and about. Maybe you're at Kroger or somewhere, and it, I mean, it's getting hot. Maybe you see somebody in some tight clothing, and maybe uh, you, you make some judgments about that person. You think, well, that person, this guy's got a tight shirt on, showing off his muscles. His, maybe... He's proud of his physique, you know, he's, um, maybe you think he's a little conceited. And so you make these judgments about him or maybe, uh, or, or, or a girl or boy, male or female, you think, well, they just want attention for them. So they want people to look at their body and be impressed. Or maybe you see somebody who is uh, wearing baggy clothes and wearing a style of clothing that you don't wear yourself. And it's just a different, their shirt's not tucked in or something. And, you make assumptions like, well, that person's messy. They must not care about their appearance. Or, boy, this person might be dangerous. You know, they're, 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 they're wearing this type of clothing. Well, instantly you've judged this person. Instantly you've made an assumption. You've judged this person. And you haven't heard a word from them. You don't know anything about them aside from a little bit of information you've taken in. And then your brain went crazy with it. Don't make assumptions about them, about others. But also, don't make assumptions about yourself. I'll share it. This is a personal struggle I have. I, I, don't, I don't care. I'll, I'll share it. Um, when I listen to people, I tend to read them for their judgment about me. I am a people pleaser just by nature. That's how I'm wired. And if you know me, you know this. And so when I listen, it, when, when I'm not my best self, you know, when I'm in desolation, when I'm stressed out, when I'm emotionally needy, I start reading people for judgment. Like, do they like me? Are they affirming me or are they denying me? Uh, or are they agreeing with me or not? What, what, are, what are they saying about me? When I do that, what I'm doing is feeding on their judgment of me. And I'm doing that because I'm getting my life from them. My validation comes from other people. What I've learned about myself is that when I get my life from Jesus, then I'm free to listen. And I'm free to not be defensive. I'm free to not read into things. You know, someone says something, I don't read into it. I just say, okay, this is what they, these are the words they say. And I'm free from the tension, the stress of trying to let that seep into my life. I don't have to do that. So first of all, don't make assumptions. Second, I would say talk face to face with someone. Uh, much of our life is online now. I mean, you're watching this online uh, maybe you you're on Facebook watching this or, or YouTube. We post them both to YouTube as well. Maybe that you're maybe you're on Twitter. There's Facebook comments and text messages. We're, so much of our life is through text or video, and video is better, I guess, because you're you're reading my expressions now. But through text, it can be dangerous. I mean, text message. I love text messages. They're good because they allow you time to think. You can think about your reaction, think about your words carefully. The problem is we often don't think. We just let our fingers start flying off the cuff, and that leads to problems. Well, online, there's distant. That we're, we're trying to get inside each other's skin. When you're talking digitally, there's more layers between you. Okay, we, we can read someone's thoughts, but 
in 140 characters or just in a few words, you lose body language. Incarnational listening means you hear someone's voice coming into your ears. You see their body language and you read what that means. I mean, it's the closest thing you can do to get inside somebody's skin. Another danger is from, we should, another reason I say talk face to face is because much of our information is through other people, through, through mediums, through the media, I should say. There's online stuff. There's the news you watch in the evening. And I mean, this is nothing, and this is nothing new that I'm saying, but often we all know that depending on where you get your news information, it's typically going to be one-sided or it's going to slant. It could be far right or left. And uh, we watch from the comfort of our homes. We're comfortable. We hear somebody else tell us this thing. And if we don't read it first through the lens of, well, they have their perspective, and then we try to find information ourselves, but it becomes a problem when we just take that information as face value. This is obviously the truth. Somebody told me. The best, nobody is objective. Nobody is objective, purely objective. We all have our uh, perspectives. We all, we all have our assumptions. And so the best thing we can do is acknowledge we are not objective. And that person on the news is not objective, purely. We all have that. Another, another value to face-to-face to someone is because sometimes when we, when we talk face-to-face to someone who's a friend, um, it, it's often about an issue or it's about other people. And that's the problem. That still isn't face-to-face. That's talking to someone about somebody else. We need to, if there's a problem with somebody or some group or some race or some perspective, listen to that person. Try to reach out. Let's, let's have coffee. Let's have a Zoom meeting. Let's FaceTime, you know, it's something where you can talk. Even just a phone call, you're hearing their voice. We need to try to do that. Uh, or, or if we're talking to a friend about an issue, what I've found is that we often talk to people. What, what I've found in my own experience is when I talk to people who agree with me, I'm just they're just reinforcing what I already believe. But when I listen to someone and I'm dispassionate, I'm not making assumptions. I'm not taking it personally. I just listen uh, to, an, to a different viewpoint. I learn a lot, not just about that person, but about myself and about the issue we're talking about. So talk to somebody face-to-face or ear-to-ear on the phone. That's listening makes a huge difference. Listening makes a huge difference. Third, I would say, and this is part of listening, is actively ask questions. You will be surprised how much you learn when you ask the simple question, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? Often we project into someone else and we think, well, I know what they're, they are this race. I know what they're going to think about this, or they're that gender. I know what they're going to think about this. And that, that's not good. We're, that's not incarnation. We're, we're projecting our lives into their skin, our brains into their brain. And that's just not good. But ask someone, what was it like growing up where you grew up in Alabama? You know, it was great. It was wonderful. Uh, what were your parents like? What was it like growing up? Where, where did you go to school? I mean, just, just information about their background, but also how do you feel? What do you think? Often we don't know about other people because we don't ask other people. We don't ask. You have not because you ask not. James 4.2. Uh, something I found helpful is to restate if, if there's a tension in the situation, restate what you're hearing. What I'm hearing you say is, da, 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 da. what I'm hearing you say is when you grew up, it was in this situation or you know what, whatever the case may be. That opens the possibility that you may have misunderstood them and they can correct you. And it shows that you're listening. Fourth and last, and I'll wrap this up, let God be the judge. Let God be the judge. Don't make assumptions. Don't judge. Let God be the judge. Our job as disciples of Jesus is to agree with what our Lord did and said. Our Lord said all of his teachings, and our Lord acted in a way that demonstrates everybody in the world is worth dying for. So my job as a disciple is to simply agree that everybody in the world is worth dying for. It's not to cast judgment on them. It's not for me to decree someone is right or wrong or someone is good or bad. It's my job just to 
speak the gospel of Jesus into their lives. Let the gospel convict them. That, that, that's the gospel. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's not my job. My job is to love. And that mind, when you do that, that mindset will change you. When you step down off of your throne of judgment and you treat people like God values them, the true judge, who, who, God, he, and you will have joy in your own heart and you'll have peace in that relationship. When you judge them, you won't. When you begin to see their value in this way, you'll see the beauty in humanity. Because right, because right now, what's happening is this is this is so big. Well, what's happening is there's so much chaos, there's so much contention and unrest is the word I keep hearing. But it's just like we focus on man, it's so bad, it's so bad out there right now. It's just awful. But if you change your perspective and you get incarnational, you ask, how do you feel? And you get inside their life, and you get inside their heart and their mind. You realize, maybe, you know, maybe just maybe there is some goodness here. Not again, not to justify any kind of bad actions or sinful behavior or wrong things, but it, just, it shifts our brain ever so slightly. It's just a, it's a course correction. It, it, it adjusts the ship a little bit where we go from man, this world is awful. These people are dirty, filthy, dangerous sinners, to where. What's, what's going on in them? What happened to them? Why are they making this choice into a path toward understanding? And when you do that, you realize these are beautiful souls. These are image bearers of God. They are ensnared by sin, and they're so valuable to God that he died for them. That will change how you look at people, and it'll change how you treat people. So the next time you hear the voice of judgment creeping in your heart or your mind, Drown it out with a blessing. When you see people on the news and they're throwing bricks or whatever, or you know, graf graffitiing monuments or whatever, just maybe pray a blessing for that person. God, please bless them and convict them of the wrongness of, of destruction, of hurting someone. And when you see uh, racial tension and, and racial hatred and just racism, pray a blessing in that into that person ask god to convict them of whatever the hardness is in their hearts and when you feel that that judgment in your own heart ask for god's blessing in your life as well bless the people you used to judge pray for them and thank god for them i believe we need to be incarnational because jesus did this the disciple is not above his lord and if paul said this church is divided this is what you need to do let this mind be in you I want to say to you, to my Goodman Oaks Church family, and to everybody, to my family, my Mississippi family, my Southeast, my Southern family, my American family, my global family, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Holy Lord, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for his love for us. We feel his long and loving gaze upon us. So, Lord, please help us to turn that long, loving gaze onto others and to look at others with love and not hatred, with respect and value and not judgment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.